to Radnor Memorial Library. My name is Pam Sador. My co-sponsor this evening is Radnor Historical Society. I see many members here tonight. And Kathy is here from Main Point Books. Main Point Books is our independent bookstore here in downtown Wayne, Pennsylvania. And I really do want to thank you all for coming. This is a very exciting event. I want to welcome you to an evening with Robert Strauss in conversation with Stephen Freed. They'll be discussing Strauss's new book, John Marshall, The Final Founder. And as I said, Radnor Historical Society, thank you, co-sponsor this evening. And welcome authors, welcome everyone to Radnor Memorial Library and thank you for joining us in this year which I won't label anymore because we're going forward. So let's start with Robert Strauss. Welcome, Robert. Robert is the author of a new book, John Marshall, The Final Founder. Robert Strauss's most recent book was Worst President Ever, a biography of James Buchanan, which won the gold medal for biography from the Independent Publishers Association. Before turning to history, Strauss was a reporter at Sports Illustrated, a feature writer for the Philadelphia Daily News, a news and sports producer at KYW TV in Philadelphia, and a TV critic for the Asbury Park and Philadelphia Inquirer. For the last two decades, he has been freelance writer and chiefly for the New York Times. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert, for Thanks. coming this evening to talk about your new book. And in conversation with Robert Strauss is author Stephen Freed. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us this evening. And Stephen Freed is the author of seven acclaimed nonfiction books, including Appetite for America, Fred Harvey and the Business of Civilizing the Wild West, One Meal at a Time. Stephen's also the author of Thing of Beauty, Supermodel Gia, which is Thing of Beauty, and Bitter Pills Inside the Hazardous World of Legal Drugs, The New Rabbi, A Common Struggle, and what connects us this evening is Rush. Revolution, Madness, and the Visionary Doctor Who Became a Founding Father. And when I knew that Robert would be joining us tonight um, or coming to talk about his new book on John Marshall, it just seemed that we had to have another founding father in the room in the name of Dr. Rush in the middle of a pandemic. And here we are in Philadelphia and we're celebrating everything about our wonderful city, our wonderful authors, and everyone here tonight. So thank you authors. And here I am introducing Robert Strauss and Stephen Fried will be talking with Robert about Robert's new book, John Marshall, The Final Founder. And here's what we'll do. Please keep yourself muted. We have such a large crowd tonight that I think it's best that um, after about 40 minutes, um, of course, the authors would love to answer your questions and it's best that we put them in the chat room. So you'll be typing in your questions in about 40 minutes from now. And thank you all for coming. Welcome Stephen and Robert. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Bob. Hey, how you doing, Steve? So I, I have to say that all our friends, Bob Strauss and I have known each other for only like, I would say like 35 years. Yeah, that's probably about right. And uh, from the journalistic community where Bob is uh, legendary for the sheer number of different things <laughs> that he can write about and is knowledgeable about. Uh, we also know each other from the, uh, the, the basketball court at the um, sporting club at the Bellevue, which sadly is closed right now, uh, but where we have played basketball. Um, Bob plays full court. I play half court. He joins our game sometimes. Um, and so we've known each other uh, both as basketball players and as fellow uh, uh, journalists and more recently as authors. Uh, and the idea a couple of years ago that we realized that we had both started writing about American history 
um, after writing about so many other things. Um, it's uh, it's kind of in the air. And I do think that um, uh, there's a rebirth in writing about American history by people who are not historians, but are really fascinated by history. And so um, I would say our books are pretty different um, just by sheer weight. Um, my Benjamin Rush biography would, you know, could you could hit somebody with it, it'd be an excellent weapon. Um, Bob's uh, books are a little skinnier, but they're also, I think, more, uh, they, he really tries to engage you in all kinds of different ways. What I liked about his book about Buchanan and about this book too, is that um, there are sections of it that are sort of straight up history for the straight up history parts of it. Um, but, you know, the way he writes uh, his history is almost like, sort of like your favorite history teacher in high school, who if you seem to be getting bored by the straight up version comes at you from another perspective. So it comes at you with some kind of interesting challenge or um, a game or something to get you to get you involved in parts of this. And I think Bob is right. Um, one of the games, one of the parlor games of American history, um, and if you're on Twitter, you see people doing this all the time, is like people love lists. Um, and especially of, of founders, like who should be on the list? So uh, I would say that Bob and I have both written books over the last two years uh, that stake our claim for our guys being on the list. And um, so and, and so just so you know where the list is, besides on Twitter, there's a thing called Founders Online. And Founders Online it has <laughs> all the papers of so far the, what they consider the seven most important founders. And for Bob's uh, edification, John Jay got on there before John Marshall. Uh. I don't know how that happened, it's kind of bad politics. Um, but I'm sure that Bob and I would love to both see our guys. I'd like to see Benjamin Rush. He'd like to see John Marshall um, up there, uh, because in reality. But but what it what it leads us to, and this is the first question I really have for Bob, and it's a question that I've actually heard people discuss in other settings too, which is uh, especially in the last year, because and, and it's a big question. It's a serious question, which is um, who really are the founders? Who gets to count on our on our list of founders? So there's actually a whole chapter in this book sort of setting up the parlor game among the most logical uh, suspects. But um, I'd like Bob to just to talk a little bit about his approach to, Mar to Marshall and also his approach to founding hood, because I think it's a really important question that will always hang over all American history. Well, founding hood, uh, in, in, well, first of all, uh, recently after I've written a book, I started looking at the early census figures of the United States. And in 1790, the first census, there were uh, about 3.8 million people in the United States, at least uh, according to the census, of which about 700,000 or seven or 800,000 were uh, white men over 16. So even if you uh, admit the age, that still isn't many who could even be a founding father. You know, they couldn't be black, they couldn't be a woman, uh, and certainly couldn't be young. Uh, so it really, in a certain sense, wasn't that hard to be a founder. Uh, when, uh, when Marshall gets to Richmond, uh, pursuing his great love, who was at that point 14, who became his wife, uh, there, he starts being, he's a lawyer, and he starts uh, becoming one of the best lawyers in Richmond. Well, big deal. There are 2,600 people living there. You know, so you, your, your step isn't that high. There are only five places in the United States bigger than the town I live in, Haddonfield, New Jersey. You know, there are only five, five places that had 10,000 people or more. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the founders uh, at least gravitated towards those places, even if they didn't live there. So, uh, uh, so in any case, they all knew each other. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times Benjamin Rush and John Marshall got together in a bar, but, but certainly they knew each other. They all knew each other. And, and uh, uh, to the extent that you become a founder, quote unquote, it, I, I would say you've done something significant even among that group. And uh, Marshall uh, uh, and Rush both had done things significant and, and in many different aspects. I mean, even if you only count Russia's med medical and, uh, and uh, signing of, uh, of the documents, that's a lot. You know, how many, how many doctors signed? Yeah, if you sign the declaration, you're in. 
Yeah, you know, exactly. I would say for, for a certain level of debate, other people would say you have to sign the Constitution and the Declaration. Declaration, right? Somebody else would say, well, if you're not, if you've never been president, then you're not really a founder. Well, you know, founder. I think it works the other way around. It's that it's that the presidents get to be one. But there are other people besides presidents, even today. I mean, you know, they, to say that John Roberts isn't a, a significant person in, uh, in in the government would be false, and he's never been nor will be president. So, uh, uh, you know, Marshall sort of makes it for, for his ubiquity, uh, much the same way Hamilton does. You know, why does Hamilton get to be a founder? I think he made a great career move in getting assassinated. You know, I mean, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, Henry Knox doesn't seem to be on the level of uh, Alexander Hamilton, yet he was in, you know, early cabinets and, and all that. So, the, you know, Marshall was the first significant Supreme Court Chief Justice, but he was many things before he ever got to be there, including Secretary of State. So, you know, I'll, I'll give him that. So um, I, I would say that if you saw Rush and John Marshall drinking, um, at a bar in Philadelphia, from what you described, since almost every scene of him, he's drinking Madeira. Yeah. Um, I would say that he was like, like sort of a little bit more of less of a, Benjamin Rush was the father of American temperance, although uh, just so you know, <laughs> back then temperance didn't include beer and wine. Oh, uh, okay. It only included, uh, you know, hard liquor, but um, you, you certainly uh, make Marshall out to be um, a bit of a drinker. And um, so it's one of the things that I, that I found interesting um, because I knew nothing about Marshall. And I would say that, you know, when people talk to me about Rush, they're kind of the same way. I knew nothing about Rush. Right. So, so um, in a way, I think that's better. Uh, you know, I don't think any of us wants to write yet another book about somebody who's had 8,000 biographies written about them. Right. And, um, but I think that uh, Marshall is interesting uh, for a lot of different reasons before he becomes the chief justice. I mean, and, and we shouldn't assume, you know, some of our readers... Uh, who are here tonight, you know, maybe they're, they, they're here because they know you from other things. They know you from your sports writing or for other writing. So just so you know, John Marshall was the second uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he was the fourth. The fourth chief justice of the Supreme Court, but it was his leader. It was his leadership that led the Supreme Court to actually have power. Right. So he made the decision in Marbury versus Madison, which basically established that the Supreme Court, um, could interpret and in fact throw out laws as unconstitutional um right. and before that and i mean i'm actually curious before that was that idea even like being discussed I, you know? I, I i'm sure it was discussed by somebody but not in great great, great detail uh alexander hamilton did write about it early on uh, even before the federalist papers he thought that the, there should be a supreme court that had judicial review that's what it's called judicial review and sort of the the terms of the uh, constitutional scholars, I guess. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the first Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice was John Jay. But you got to remember that when the Constitution was, you know, finished and they, they, uh, we start building up this country, there were no conflicts. The first uh, uh, Supreme Court session with Jay as the leader had one case and they dismissed it. Because there weren't, you know, there weren't conflicts yet between the governmental entities, uh, uh, and it, it was only even when Marshall takes over in in in, uh, uh, in uh, the end of eighteen hundred, early eighteen oh one, there isn't much going on. And to, to show you about this, that that uh, uh, the first and third Supreme Court uh, Chief Justices Jay and Ellsworth go to Europe and negotiate treaties while they're chief justice, you know? So, so one, there's not that much going on. And two, they're both, they're, they're members of both the executive and uh, judicial parts of. of so the is that, is that because the States hadn't yet said like, okay, there's going to be something above our Supreme courts. Like they didn't basically view the Supreme court as being that it was only for things that were interstate. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, they, well, even even as the, our country got together, we were still separated. I mean, it, you, you know, I, I always make the joke that we're 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 now uh, uh, fifty countries uh, 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 put together with a little defense uh, 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 
treaty. But but uh, but it, it was it was more true then more true then and and, and we you know you can remember just figuring out this country you know it, it, that's why George Washington was such an important guy is because he's deciding what the president is going to be like you know to a certain extent people like Madison were deciding what Congress was going to be like but it was more important to decide what the president was going to do and in a sense that Marshall took over later on and decided what the Supreme Court was going to be. Uh, uh, and, and the traditions we hold, I mean, when you go down, if you go down and go to the Supreme Court building, which is catty corner to the uh, uh, White House, you, you, you walk in and there's this big statue of Marshall. And then in a, in a glass case, there's his uh, 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 chair. And when- I his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see Supreme Court justice gets sworn in, they get to sit in his chair for a day, and it right. and it sort of faces the rest of them. So it's a so it, you know all the all the current Supreme Court justices have some veneration for Marshall, even you know whether they care too much about reading about him, I don't know. But but the but there's a certain you know Babe Ruth quality to Marshall. So so tell us a little. You know, one of the things that I always find interesting about early American history is that the stories that we told are either stories told through primarily through Boston, through Massachusetts or through mm -hmm. Virginia, the right. small worlds of those places. I mean, I found to try to write about rush. I was trying to actually tell a Philadelphia story that wasn't just about Benjamin Franklin. Cause I think that a lot of times Philadelphians don't know, they know who came here, but they mm -hmm. don't always know what happened here. But I was actually surprised to realize what a interesting insider Marshall was. So correct me if I'm wrong, but, Marshall's dad and Washington were buds. Right, they were surveyors. They were fellow surveyors. And often, uh, I mean, uh, Washington was already sort of a semi-hero. The only, the only uh, uh, patriot who was really a hero because he fought the French in the Indian War. And he came back in a, in a retreat from uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, with the, the de his dead commander. And, and he came back and, and saved the rest of the the troops and and, and uh, you know he 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 had some sort of reputation. Uh, as why did he know Marshall's dad? What did Marshall's dad do, and what was his significance to Washington? Oh, just because they were surveyors together, and they they got to know a guy named Lord Fairfax, who was the only sort of British uh, uh, owner of a state or whatever you want to call them, who actually lived in the United States, who actually lived here. And so Lord Fairfax had a library, which not everybody had. And he, anyway, he employed these two guys sort of independently, and they got to know each other. They were, they were the guys who played basketball at noon, you know. So, <laughs> so, so you know, it, it, and, and often these surveyors, they didn't get paid in, in money. They got paid in land. And land was the big thing to have in, in, in colonial America. Uh, and they had a lot of it, and Washington had a, a real lot of it. And uh, and uh, Marshall, Marshall's dad got some, and so and his was in sort of Western Virginia, not West Virginia, but uh, uh, along the Blue Ridge and, and a little west of that. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, he built up a little cadre of land. And and uh, when they went to war, uh, the the Marshalls, at that point, John being. Uh, 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 you know, in his late teens, early twenties, uh, went off with his father as a little semi-lieutenant or whatever. You know, they 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 took on their own uh, officer levels, but but uh, uh, so they fought a little bit at, prior to Valley Forge. In other words, they have, not in 1776, not in the, the battles of Trenton and all, but the other battles like Germantown, and then they retreated to Valley Forge. Uh, his father went off in some other capacity, and he he uh, became sort of this junior officer at Valley Forge, which is where he starts his reputation, Marshall. Because so he, and, so he and Hamilton are the kiddo officers; they're both in yes. twenty one. It's it's always I would say that for early American readers, one of the most important things to always remind yourself is what year people were born. Right. Because I think we tend to smush all the founding fathers together. And I think it's incredibly important to remind yourself who was basically someone's dad's age, right? Someone's kid's age. So 
Benjamin Rush was 30 when he signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And when Hamilton and Marshall were at Valley Forge in early 1778, they were 21. Right. And, and Rush actually specifically said, like, who are these punk kids that Washington is starting to right. listen to? Right, right. Because, of course, we were getting our asses kicked in the war then, so it wasn't like we were doing so great. Um, but so Marshall and Hamilton were the, were the same age, and um, they were, uh, and Hamilton was of New York, and, and Marshall was of Virginia. Now, you tell us lots of times that Thomas Jefferson and Marshall hated each other's guts, but you don't tell us why. So okay. why did Jefferson and Marshall not like each other? Okay, so, so it, it, it... It, it, it sort of is a, uh, uh, well, you'll see why it's love-hate. Okay, so they were second cousins. And through their mother's side, they were in the Randolph family. Now, the Randolphs were not, uh, I, I don't want, know what you want to call them, the Kennedys or something like that, who have been there for generations. They've been there for a couple generations. So they were sort of aristocracy, such as it was in Virginia. Uh, so to be even vaguely related, you sort of touch them. Uh, there were other r real Randolphs who were like uh, Edmund, the, the governor of, of Virginia for a time. But, but at any rate, uh, when Marshall, uh, uh, Marshall ends up marrying his great love, which is sort of a funny story because she was 13 when they met and he was smitten with her and, and uh, they're in Williamsburg and he's going to law school for like a second and a half. And uh, 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 her father married a woman who Jefferson proposed to, and she rejected him. So Jefferson is a little older too, like Benjamin Rush. You know, uh, uh, the woman is a little younger, but but still older than uh, Marshall. And and so there's there's this animosity that starts, and and then. At that point, you know how it is. It's like it, it's like you don't. It, it's sort of that is your founder at Valley Forge, right? right. And, and, and then everything, yeah, everything he does is a pain in the ass to you. And and at some point, then Jefferson gets a better job and he goes off to Europe. And Marshall is building up his reputation in Virginia. And by you know Jefferson is sort of a forgotten guy when he comes back from Europe. And, and he comes back and he sees a, a number of people, including his friend Madison, but certainly Marshall being a big deal in Virginia. And Marshall is the guy who, uh, who uh, uh, with Hamilton, but he as the speaker, because Hamilton is not, I mean Hamilton, Madison, who is not a very good speaker. Marshall is the speaker to uh, helping uh, Virginia to uh, ratify the constitution against Patrick Henry, who is really the power in Virginia, but but uh, Marshall ekes out a victory, and uh, yeah, you do a really nice job describing how the Constitution was barely ratified. Right. Yeah. Now, it was, I, I forget. I wonder the, why we're still arguing about or, it. Set by ten. You know what I mean? Uh, like the Sixers last night, they they were losing, losing, losing their lead, and suddenly they just eke it out. Right. So so, uh, but it was important for. I mean, even though nine states had already ratified the Constitution. Uh, which which made it uh, valid to be the, the the binding document. It really didn't matter if Virginia and New York didn't do it. I mean, yeah, you would have had a country, but if Virginia said no, it had twenty one percent of the population of the colonies. You know, it was the biggest colony. New York was second, uh, uh, second far behind, but still second. And neither of them were in the first nine. So when Marshall takes over this debate in Virginia and wins it in an upset, you know, he is, he's further moved up in this founder category, even though he would, he claims he would have been just as happy to be the best lawyer in Richmond. You know, that's a bunch of crap, obviously. Uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he, he becomes this power in the biggest state. And well, let me just ask you, because I, I feel like we didn't establish this, like, right. if, tell us what Marshall is like, like as a person, if we met him, as an adult, right. what, what's he like? He so so uh, the the thing that sort of tells most about him is his courtship, so to speak, or his, his time of courtship. 
he goes, he, he comes back from the war early and his father has this little uh, job in Williamsburg. They, they, they're not from Williamsburg, they're from the Western part of the state, but it doesn't matter. Williamsburg is the capital. And, and, uh, and he, he's got nowhere really to go. So he goes to see his father. And as he's going to see his father, uh, uh, those of you who have seen Hamilton will, will appreciate this that there's this family, the Amblin family, with three teenage or daughters who decide, oh, this war hero's coming to town. Let's have a party for him. So they have this party for him. And the youngest daughter, Polly, says, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sink my hooks into him or whatever she says. And uh, uh, she's 13. And so anyway, he comes to this party and he's, it's not what they, it, you know, it's not uh, 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 Christopher Reeve as Superman. It's John Voight. I don't know. He comes with a fringe jacket and a hat and he sort of slouches. And he's well, John Voight, like in what? Like in uh, Deliverance or? Uh, no, no, you know, I mean, John Voight in uh, Midnight Cowboy. You know? Midnight Cowboy, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, but not, not so. Anyway, yeah, so, and he, he's not coming there to court anybody. He's coming there because his, his father's going to find him a job. So, so, uh, but in any case, at this party, the, you, because the letters and diaries are all for the older sister, that's the perspective. And the young daughter, like, says, yeah, sure. She, they, he's smitten with her from this party. So meanwhile, he decides to go to law school. Well, law school is uh, at William and Mary, and there's a guy named George Wythe, who is the guy that everybody studies under, uh, Jefferson did, for instance. And... Uh, 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 Marshall has only gone to one year of school. Now you think about the founding fathers. I mean, Washington didn't go to much school, but Marshall went to one year of school when he was about 10. His father sends him off to someplace to study. Uh, so here he's got no, no school except for what his father's library uh, got him to, to do and the army. And uh, uh, he starts going to this law school and in his letters, it's like a junior high uh, uh, girl, because he's writing, you can see this on the letters, uh, uh, pa uh, Polly uh, Amblin and John Marshall, you know, uh, and uh, Marcus Ruling, M, uh, M uh, uh, A and J M. So meanwhile, her father gets another job in Richmond, and he, he in, in this sort of early time, and he says, ah, you know, I've, I've studied a little bit of law. My second cousin, Thomas Jefferson, is governor. He can sign my thing. Well, at that point, you know, he's nothing, right? So Jefferson signs his, uh, his uh, uh, whatever he's going to sign, and he's a lawyer. This is what a lawyer is, a, a guy who spent one year of school when he's 10. About, so is, he a, is he a good guy? Is he a nice guy? Is yeah, he a, he's a very nice guy. guy. Everybody likes him. Everybody likes him. He's, he, he's like my other guy, Buchanan. Uh, well, except that Buchanan was a failure as a, as a government employee, but he was an incredibly nice guy. And, and that's what Marshall is, too. They, they want to please everybody. Uh, yes, he gets into an argument with Jefferson, but you know, in a sense, that's later on when they're Federalists and, and, and Republicans or whatever you want to call Jefferson's party. But, but so he goes off, like I told you, to Richmond. He, be, he marries the girl. He becomes this great lawyer. He gets on various committees because Richmond's the capital. Now, it, it, let, let me say that the capital in Richmond, you know, isn't some great state house. It's sort of a, an overgrown warehouse is the capital. There's no paving in any place. There's a little rivulet in the middle of the street, and you know what that's got in it. So you got to jump over that if you're staying on the other side to get into the state house. So, you know, you, 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 if you think about this country and people founding about the founding fathers, well, I mean, even Richmond wasn't much, you know? So you're not impressed with the founding fathers, is what you're saying. You say uh, anybody can be the founding father and they weren't such a big deal. I'm, I'm impressed with them because I'm, the reason why I'm impressed with them is they, they come from virtually nothing. I mean, you know, such as it is, Washington comes from something because he's got a lot of land and his father was somebody. And, and, and uh, 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 Adams uh, uh, establishes his right to be a founding father in, 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 in uh, Boston and, and such as it is uh, Franklin in Philadelphia. But, but uh, they didn't come from some sort of long line. It's not the crown 
You know, it's not, uh, it's not somebody did something in the 14th century, so we got to follow it. It's they're making it up. And that's what's so, so impressive about it. Right. So one of the things that's really interesting about his relationship with Washington um, is that he, after Washington dies, gets to write the first biography of Washington, which I, I think probably is a um, you know, double-edged sword in terms of a gig. Right. Um, but the people who got to write the first histories of anything during this time period were very powerful. And so the, the one story that I, that I wish you had put in the book, but it's okay, it's in my book. And okay. it's the only Marshall story in my book because <laughs> when Marshall was writing this biography, Benjamin Rush was aware that he had been given these letters that showed that George Washington, for years before he died, was really angry at Benjamin Rush um, because of a oh, letter really? that he because of a letter that he had written during the the worst part of the uh, Revolutionary War, which okay. criticized Washington. And Patrick Henry gave Washington this letter, and Washington never forgave rush for writing this letter and there's lots of great stuff in your book about how petty these people were they're no pettier than us i guess right. um, you know, same things that we argue about about a basketball game you should hear our arguments about ben simmons if you're worried about <laughs> um, so but and so rush knows that marshall has this gig and he has all of washington's letters and he knows that washington specifically made sure that this letter got to his biographer because he wanted his biographer to let people know what rush had done um, so Rush is like begging Marshall to not use the letter um, in his book. And um, what he finds out is that he, when he begs him, it's too late. He had already, the book is already depressed. Right. Right. But Marshall had actually cut him a break and crossed out the parts of the letters that identified that it was from Rush. So everybody who already knew, knew it was the letter from Rush. But Marshall had, had cover for them. But I, I think it's really interesting. And for us as writers, it really reminds us that you know, the, at this point, people weren't sure America was going to continue. You know, they weren't sure that it, whether it was too early to be writing biographies or writing right. the story of the revolution because they weren't sure it was going to last. And Marshall, uh, from writing Washington's biography and then actually overseeing the court, is actually overseeing the period when America decides that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to make it. Right. And, and I do think that's part and of my Marshall contention is that Marshall... Because of what he does at the court. Yeah, my, I, my contention is that Marshall, this is, I have an essay in, in my book about when did the founding end? In other words, what, like just what Steve's saying, you know, when, when was it sure that this was going to happen? And that's, when, that's the only time I really went to other uh, historians and asked them their opinions. And, and, and there's one guy who says, oh, you mean it's over? You know, it's like, no, you know, like this is the whole point is that it's never over. You know, the argument is never over. And, and uh, um, uh, but, but what, uh, what happens with this uh, biography, uh, to explain a little bit, um, Marshall was, despite Hamilton's, uh, uh, you know, you, you've, everybody's seen the movie, the, the, movie, uh, the, the, uh, the play Hamilton by now, at least people of our ilk, I'm sure. And, 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 a play and, that needs some aggressive fact checking, I would like to say. Oh yeah, right. But but that's not the point, really. But but in any case, what? But you know, I, Washington is is the supreme being in this. Even you know the uh, the 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 funny songs by uh, King King George the Third. You know, uh, uh, nobody looms quite as large, right? Uh, uh, so so. Uh, but but Marshall is his number one acolyte. I would say he is the person who adores Washington more than anybody. And when Mark, well, this is sort of a funny thing, I guess. Mark Marshall is a, a, a member of Congress in Philadelphia when, when Washington dies. And the message that, of Washington's death is coming to him. And it's one of the things I want to impress upon people is that how amazing it is that this country happens because things can't get from one place to another. Washington dies in, uh, in, in Mount Vernon, and people know that's sort of like uh, southeast of, uh, of present-day Washington, but there was no Washington at that point. And so the rider has to get to Philadelphia to deliver this to somebody, who to somebody happens to be Marshall, and it takes them three and a half days to get there. 
three and a half days we, we got to figure well you know they run into a tree stump or that but you got to ford a, a stream or you got to change horses or whatever this guy had to do to get there and so marshall then delivers this eulogy which he copies from one of the lees you know first in war first in peace and and, and uh, first in the hearts of his countrymen which he didn't invent but he said it at the eulogy so it became connected with him and uh uh on wikipedia now so he said it yeah yeah so so uh in any case he he he's he's befriended a guy named bushrod washington who was washington's nephew and when uh the papers all sort of get sorted bushrod gets the papers but he says well my friend john would be better writing this than me and we'll sort of split the profits and they make a, a you know, a, a typical, you know, a presidential deal with a, a publisher in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, Marshall, not because he's got so much to do being Supreme Court Chief Justice, which he does, but just because he takes his time and they sell subscriptions to this. And Marshall doesn't get the first one in on time. I mean, not by a week and a half, but by a couple of years. And so people have asked for their money back. And he comes out with this first volume and Washington isn't even in it. This is the precursor volume. This is the history of the United States to Washington. So people are pissed. And John Adams, who loves Marshall, writes a review for some uh, publication saying, this is like the most turgid thing I've ever read. And, and uh, you know, very negative. Uh, but he still comes out with the other volumes eventually. But what happens with this is a guy who was selling this thing for the publisher, a guy named Mason Weems, Parson Weems, decides he's going to write a Washington semi-biography with a lot of fiction whipped in and making a myth out of Washington. And he's, you know, the cherry tree guy, among other things. And nobody, nobody promotes it as a real biography, but something, some other thing that, that, that we sort of needed, because at this point, the, the, there's a fractious nature to uh, the rest of the government. And if we could only harken back to the days of Washington, you know, which is in a certain sense is last week in their time, we can, we can look up to somebody. So Washington then becomes this myth that we have. A, a, an important myth. He was a real man and he did real things. He did really great things. He was the, uh, you know, we're lucky. We're lucky that uh, we had Washington. We could have had, uh, I don't know. James Hamilton. Hamilton, uh, right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that you do a really nice job in the book um, talking about the mythology of American history writing in general. Right. Just so you understand, because you're making these illusions that people haven't seen the book. So the book is literally broken up into chapters and some of them are more straightforward history and some of them really are essays on subjects that fold in uh some contemporary writing and some history writing uh it's really a, a very interesting mixed bag um and it allows you to come at the material from all different perspectives um but we haven't really talked much about marbury versus madison we really haven't talked about the big kahuna right. so right. talk to us about that case about what was happening in marshall's life when it happened about whether anybody knew what a big deal it was, but also just what was happening during Marbury versus Madison. Okay, so Mar Marshall, at the end of uh, 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 Adams's uh, administration, he becomes Secretary of State because Adams finds that his Secretary of State is is telling Hamilton lots of stuff about him and trying. Uh, so he fires him, and, and he likes Mar uh, Marshall. He's done a number of things which we didn't get into, but but he's a he's a prominent man, and he becomes Secretary of State very late in the Adams presidency. At this point, Washington is being built, uh, you know, uh, uh, Washington D.C., and he uh, Adams gets uh, uh, Marshall to supervise the building of Washington D.C. Now you think that's a big deal, but as Secretary of State, it's sort of like Chief of Staff is now. And uh, uh, Marshall had about seven employees. It isn't some vast bureaucracy we've got here. But in, in any case, uh, uh, the the Supreme Court Chief Justice, as I said, well, Ellsworth is is stuck in France. 
he's sick, he can't make the next boat. So they got it. He, so uh, 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 Adams consults Marshall, who should it be? And Marshall comes up with a bunch of people. And Adams says, no, I think it'll be you. So now Adams, excuse me, Marshall is both uh, Secretary of State and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. At this point, the election of 1800 happens. Uh, Adams loses. It's a, it's a complicated election because of uh, Aaron Burr and uh, Jefferson. The time goes on uh, the, the, in the dispute there. It's now February. March 4th is the, uh, is the time when they're going to change. Should they, you know, then there's a the thought to make Marshall the interim president while they sort of figure it out. But in, in a semi-bribe to the to the representative from Delaware, uh, uh, the Jeffersonians win. So it's clear Jefferson's going to be uh, president, but the Federalists still hold all the power. So they come up with this thing called the Midnight Judges, and so they get a whole bunch of people in various positions uh, in the federal bureaucracy. One of which is uh, a uh, Justice of Peace in Washington. And one of those guys is a guy named William Marbury, who's sort of an operator. Uh, people in New Jersey would know George Norcross as this kind of, you know, like he's, he's always got a connection to everything. George might be watching tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, so it's like he's a, he, he, he gets a little uh, money, uh, money because he, he helps the Secretary of the Navy find the property. He does, well, anyway, Marbury's done all this stuff. So meanwhile, now it's March 3rd, and uh, uh, Marshall is in his office signing these things because he's Secretary of State. And uh, people are out delivering them, including his brother, James. Well, the, the clock strikes, and, you know, and, and Marshall's out. Uh, and uh, uh, all of these things haven't gotten delivered. Not all of them, some of these things haven't gotten delivered including the one to William Marbury. Now, Marbury, like I said, is an operator. If it weren't Marbury, I don't know, maybe this whole case would have never come to fruition and Marshall would have had to find a different case, but it does. And uh, uh, what has happened though, is that they're trying to, Republicans, the Jeffersonians are trying to negate all these judges. Now, you, you think we've got like a, a majority on the Supreme Court now of conservatives, Every judge, every federal judge in the United States was a federalist. You know, they were only federalist presidents. So, so the, the Republicans are trying to negate whatever they can. And, um, um, but Marbury is suing for this job. And uh, Madison, as the new Secretary of State, says, oh, come on, you know, it's, it's, it's a nothing job. You're not getting it. We're not signing it over. We're not in instituting this. Well, Marshall sees this as his test case. And but in the meantime, the Republicans have have postponed the, the new Supreme Court uh, uh, sessions for 18 months, 19 months, really. So Marshall's got plenty of time to figure out what he's going to do. And he, he in, he's decided that he's taking this job and he's going to really do this job. He's, he's looking at like what's going to save like I said, the country is fractious. If, if it lasts much longer, they're going to, he views it as breaking up. And he's a federalist, and he wants a, a secure uh, uh, federalist kind of country uh, 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 where there's the Constitution binding us. So uh, he starts writing this opinion even before it's decided. And uh, there's six members of the Supreme Court and he wants to have, he, Marshall's big thing is they, they, all, every decision is unanimous decision. Now it might be four to two, but we're going to write it as if we're together, because this is how I view it. He has them all, the session's only three months, but, uh, and sometimes shorter, they all stay at the same hotel. Now it's not, Washington's not very big, and, and this hotel they stay at. And one of the, what happens is one of the Supreme Court justices has gout so he can't make it to the chambers which is really only a few blocks away in the basement of the capitol building they stuck it congress has stuck it in the basement it's in a it's in an, a, a a room where there are church services on sunday and sometimes dances on saturday this is what the supreme court is you know at this point so uh, uh 
Anyway, so Marshall decides, well, we're going to meet in the hotel lobby and have this case. So the case, Marbury versus Madison, the most important case in, in America, uh, American jurisprudence, is decided in the lobby of a hotel, because that's what the, the, uh, the, the justices can all get to. Uh, there's this, is he drinking? Uh, I'm sure they're drinking. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and uh, Madison doesn't even show up. You know, even though he's only a block away, this is not important to him at all. He's got he's got a country to run, you know, because he's now Jefferson's chief of staff. And this is like, who cares? You know, who cares about William Marbury? Well, Marshall does. And what Marshall uh, decides is a very convoluted thing. He's not he's a, not a great writer. But what he also always does is he gives a sop to the other side. So in this decision. He he uh, he says that uh, uh, Mar Marbury does not deserve his uh, his new job. You know, Madison doesn't have to appoint him, so that's their little stop. But then he he does a convoluted run about, around the Judiciary Act of 1789, which I'm not going to get uh, uh, completely into. But the sum and substance is it says Marshall says it, that act goes against. What the Constitution says, and therefore it's null and void. Well, nobody ever expected anything like that. No, I wouldn't. Okay, this is the question I wanted to ask you when I was reading this in the book. Right. Now, some of the guys who wrote the Constitution were still alive. Right. right? So when we say today the justices want to know what did the writers, what did the framers say? I mean, some of the framers were alive. So is part of judicial review at that time, like did he like ask Jefferson what he meant? Did or ask, you know, did he ask Adams what he meant? Did he ask any of the other living writers of the Constitution what they meant? I don't think so. I think he, I think he thought he knew. Now, perhaps he, he talked with them in 1790 in a, in a, in a discussion at a bar in Philadelphia. But, but uh, no, I really, you know, it's, it's sort of funny that, 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 that that's where I believe that democracy happened. Because what did these guys from South Carolina, who had never been north of North Carolina, and get to Philadelphia, what are they doing? They're they they're depending on talking with other people. They're, the they're, city tavern. Yeah, you know, and 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 Philadelphia wasn't very big, you know. It, it was like from Seventh Street to the river, and there were forty thousand people jammed in there. But you know, but 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 nonetheless, uh, uh, this this thing of judicial review, even if they cared about it, they would say, "Oh, it's just this one time," you know, just this one time. And and Marshall says. It's not going to be this one time. And he's not going to say, I'm going to be living for 34 more years and do this time and time again. But, but he's got this idea of, of how the government is going to be. And, and, and uh, by the way, he should have recused himself because he's the cause that, that Barbara didn't get his uh, uh, appointment. You know, he didn't get it. What do you think would have happened to the development of America if he had not done this? If it not done this, it, it would have fractured. I think it, it, there would have been there would have been no way there, there would have been not there might not have been Marbury versus Madison, but several of the other cases were important. They did Gibbons versus Ogden, McCullough versus the, uh, 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 Maryland. Uh, the, several of the things that he decided in a similar way that 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 uh, the uh, Supreme Court had review over things between states and people between. Uh, e, 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 each uh, each of the states between the state and the federal government each one of these could have negated a law or uh, overturned a law or, or but the supreme court had uh, a review of it uh, if that didn't happen how would these things be adjudicated you know maryland would have said uh, 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 you know uh, if they couldn't tax the uh, they would just tax the uh, the bank. That's McCullough versus Maryland, uh, 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 taxing the federal bank. Uh, you know, said so, uh, hell with you. You know, we got enough money. We're going to go off on our own. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, there's no real uh, thing in the Constitution for secession yet. You know, the the uh, uh, the Confederate states found a way to do it, uh, and and so the Civil War would not have happened over slavery. It would have happened over really states' rights, other rights other than slavery.
But do we have any evidence of what the did the other fan? I mean, did like Jefferson think like, wow, this is a big deal that you did this? No, yeah. because Jefferson hated Marshall. Yeah, yeah. Jefferson was on. The, yeah, Jefferson was on the other side. He would. He would. He just didn't even believe that. He, he no, but it, but but somebody can recognize that if a thing happens in court that's going to change right. the world. I'm not saying he's happy. I'm saying no, no. He, he recognized what a big thing it is. Yeah, he didn't. He, he he what he wanted was what he wanted was a, a narrower thing. He didn't want all these judges, right? So so uh, there was there were several other uh, uh, judicial appointees that didn't get their uh, uh, places because of this. In addition to Marbury, but but what he wanted was a, the president. He wanted was I can appoint whoever I want, you know, and and so Marshall gives him you can appoint some people, kind of thing. Uh, and this whole court packing thing was reversed. Is that is that the, the one of the one of the things that that happened is that the the uh, uh, number of Supreme Court justices was going to go down to five, and so that therefore the Republicans couldn't appoint the next one because once the sixth one uh, uh, left, there were five and they were still all Federalists. So it was it was still an internecine fight. Now the parties were real that Washington never wanted, the Federalists and the Jeffersonians. So it, I, right. I, see, I see Pam is joining yeah, us. Yeah, right. I am. I know. Well, <laughs> well, you well, while you're, me and, while me you're bringing Bob these. Talk, me and Bob could talk for a long time. I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I know. And I love how you, you bring John Marshall to life and, and Dr. Brush. But now we have all these people in the room. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. That was wonderful. You know, it's only in Philly where you can just sit and listen to two historians gossip about the founding fathers. And I love that. And I love how now when I go to Valley Forge next time, I'll be thinking about Marshall and von Steuben and Elizabeth Drinker when it took her two days to go out there. Right, and right. who else? Lafayette, will you name it? I mean, we're just so lucky to be where we are. I know Robert, you're over there in New Jersey. Stephen, you're downtown right near just a couple blocks Hall. from where it all happened. I know you are That's a couple right. blocks away. And so um, let's look at this chat room because I know we have, um, what do we have there? Ooh, okay. This is from Ron Smith. Hi, Ron. Um, and Aaron Burr was 18, 19 years old and commanded the picket post in what is now Villanova as the outer picket for Valley Forge. Yeah, there were several other. I mean, Radner actually had some people in it, uh, you know, that Washington put there in several other places than in Valley Forge. Yeah. Or how about the Hanging Rock? The Hanging Rock was where the guard was, you know, to make your way out there, you had to get through that Hanging Rock. That okay. place is sacred. It's so sacred. I'm so sure sacred to, to teenagers from Radner High School, too. Okay, what would Marshall think? And this is from, uh, what would Marshall think of today's Supreme Court? Well, the thing about the Supreme Court is that he would have okayed that. You know, you think about the Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, it, it, whether, the, well, elitists are, are thought of as uh, left-wing people at, uh, in some uh, uh, fairyland, but, but there's no more elite bodied in the Supreme Court. Because you think about it, who do they have to impress? Each other, that's it, you know? And uh, uh, they do go by a lot of his rules. And, and uh, um, you know, they're all, with the exception of Amy, uh, you know, from uh, Harvard or Yale, and, and she's from some like negligible uh, college, Notre Dame, you know? Uh, but but you know, I'm making a joke. It's not, you know, it's not like she's not qualified to be where she is. So, so uh, um, he would have enjoyed this place where they, where they dress, you know, they dress in robes, but, be, but the early Supreme Court justices wanted to dress like they did in England in some flashy manner. So Marshall says, yeah, this is not, when he gets in, this is not gonna happen. And in fact, they, at the John Marshall house now, they have a save the robe fund because one of his robes is there and it's got like sweat stains and all that. It's just a black. I, I saw that because I watched your video there. I saw okay, the robe. Yeah. It was whoa. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so uh, yeah, I gave him money for the robe, you know. <laughs> 
So, so uh, uh, I think he would have uh, approved of a, uh, of a, you know, there's something about John Roberts that, that he's, he's come across, I think, this notion that he doesn't want to be on the wrong side of history. He wants to be, he, he's looking at his legacy, as many of them do. So they're big legacy people. I mean, I think that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia were, were big le legacy people, even though they were on different sides of the, uh, of the coin there. So uh, I think he would have approved of the Supreme, of the Supreme Court as it stands. Okay, and um, oh, this is good. Um, Stephen and also Robert, what are the email addresses for Robert Strauss and Stephen Freed? If you wanna just put uh, that I'll, out I'll there. First. Uh, my middle name is Seth. So it's R. Seth Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S-S at Verizon.net. Um, okay. It's easier to, for people to get me at my website, which is www.stephenfried.com. Um, okay. I also posted in the chat, um, one of the things that we've been able to do uh, with the help of the University of Pennsylvania Libraries and the library company is we built a Benjamin Rush portal. Um, I see the portal. With the special collections. And the portal actually allows you to read pretty much everything Rush wrote that's digitized. I mean, I wish I had had it when I was doing my yeah. book. It would have taken two years less. Uh, if I had had this portal. Um, so we started out just trying to post things so that students of all ages, uh, whether it's high school students writing book reports or academics writing books would be able to get easy access because part of the challenge of writing about lesser founders or right. founders that are trying to get on the founder group is that people tend to use their secondary source writing about them because it's not as easy to get their primary material. Right. And so what you see is a lot of things repeated that some of which are ridiculous, some of which were made up as part of mythology. I mean, as Bob explained, I mean, the right. mythology that was created about Washington. And by the way, you can make fun of it. But I think that what's interesting about Marshall's period is that we do have to consider the possibility that after the election of 1800, America could have easily blown up right. for a variety of reasons having to do with the election, how ugly it was but also something that will make Philadelphians hearts warm, okay? By leaving Philadelphia, by leaving a city where the government could be in a central place around people who are living mm -hmm. and moving the government to a place where there's no there there. Yeah, pigs, right. You know, you know pigs and mosquitoes <laughs> and a swamp. You know, the challenge, I don't think they did this on purpose, but they shouldn't have moved there until everything was done. Right. Uh, but by doing that, and having, you know, Adams and Jefferson never speak to each other for the next, you know, 13 years until Benjamin Rush gets them back together because they're so mad at each other. What they did is sort of an unforced error, which means, I mean, America was like tendentious enough as it was for the, for the, for the capital to move in 1800 to a place that barely existed, made it that much worse. And also to a place that was a slave state. I mean, that's why Washington right. was made the Capitol, because that was part of the deal that they were. And so the building, so the Capitol building was being built by slaves, which I'm sure people from the North were not so thrilled about. So the, the, the country was in a weird place. It like from in the first 10 years they were in Washington, that was different than the weird place they were in when they were in Philly, where at least was the center of commerce. There were a lot of people around and people went there um, so, I mean, of course, we Philadelphians think that the capital should have never left. Right. Um, and our love-hate relationship with Philadelphia and with American history come from the fact that in 1800, not only did the federal capital leave, but even the state capital left. State capital left. Right. Right. So, so even the state house, which we now call Independence Hall, wasn't even the state house anymore. Right. Um, I mean, they were going to knock it down and they were going to melt the Liberty Bell um, until Lafayette came later and started getting Americans excited about American history. Right. Like before, before that, they weren't even sure we should have American history. Um, and that's when they started calling you know, this building that they were ready to knock down, Independence Hall. And that's how the Liberty Bell got saved. Otherwise it would have been melted down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I see there's some other questions. Okay, let's go. Uh, we, we got about a minute or two left. And my okay. email is p. Uh, Sidor, P-S-E-D-O-R at radnerlibrary.org. Thank you, Ron. Uh, okay, do you find it historically ironic that Roger Taney, one of the worst chief justices, follows John 
Marshall? Well, it's hard, it's hard to, it depends on who you are. I mean, it, Roger Taney was a, was a, a, a venerable, uh, he, he lasted almost as long as Marshall. And the Dred Scott decision is, is really, uh, it's too long a story to tell in one minute, but, uh, but I, 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 it's, it, it's to uh, 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 Buchanan's, my other guy's uh, uh, first step at being the worst president. He, he, he put his foot in the mud even before he was president. But uh, uh, Taney was an interesting character. And guess who his brother-in-law was? Francis Scott Key, yet another slaveholder who, uh, you know, uh, in the whole Colin Kaepernick thing, you forget that who wrote this whole song that, that uh, you know, you're not supposed to deal in front of, but the, one of the guys who defended the slave trade in, in, uh, in Washington, you know? Uh, 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 so, uh, you know, the, it's a very complicated country, as, as Stephen says, because that's not much later, right? That's the War of 1812. You know, we get another war soon after. But the one thing I want to say is that, that my father had this great uh, historical library. And one thing I have here is the papers of John Marshall. It's not the papers of John Marshall. This is the abstract of the papers of John Marshall, right? Wow. All these guys wrote a lot, and they, I feel they had some idea that they were doing something that should be recorded by all of them. Almost all of them wrote a lot. Almost all of them have extensive papers. You know, Stephen saying Rush does. Well, you go to the similar thing to what he's talking about at University of Virginia with with uh, uh, Marshall. I mean, you, you, you can't. You, you're not going to sit there and read every last letter. But but they all had the idea that something they were doing was important. That's how I feel. I uh, certainly Hamilton did, and, and, and Madison records every note it, that happened in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, says he, nobody can read it until after he dies. Well, that's who thinks there's a legacy going on in the 1780s, right? So, uh, uh, you know, they were they were prolific about what, what about things. Yeah, and I remember when Stephen talked with us about um, Dr. Rush, that his family, because Dr. Rush had not spoken well of George Washington, right. the family kept those letters from historians yeah, were, a lot of them were letters between him and adams because adams didn't speak particularly well of george washington either well the, i mean part of it was that they were mad you know they had this idea that uh, fame had taken the place of the of the monarchy mm -hmm. and so they couldn't believe since they were still alive and franklin and washington were dead all they kept hearing was that franklin and washington did everything did everything right right and so but they weren't wrong and keep in mind we forget in our lifetime how many founding fathers have like gotten TV specials and uh, you know stuff like that. Because if you think about 1976, which of course the Philadelphia did not do such a good job with right. the bicentennial, but you know that is the beginning even of people paying attention to Adams was the mm -hmm. Adams Chronicles, which was on PBS. So you know people didn't know Jefferson, they didn't know Adams, they didn't know Hamilton, they didn't know Rush. You know, up through fairly recently, I mean, before the David McCulloch biography of John Adams, and that happened in 2001. Right. Okay, that book seems like it's been around forever because it's so monolithic, but it's a relatively recent book. It and Devil in the White City, to me, are the books that reinvigorated our idea of what American history writing can be. Mm -hmm. But that started in a way like during and right after 9-11. And so, before, and, 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 right. So before that, you have you have a burst of interest in the in the in the uh, revolutionary period right after the Second World War, and you have all those you know big tomes you know, but they're they're mostly about a world where Franklin and Washington matter the most. Right, right. And we get to know Adams. We also get to know Abigail Adams. Oh yes, yeah. I mean she's nothing. Washington, right. Start paying attention to other characters besides them, and now I think it's a really wonderful time because. Basically, anybody who left writing is now going to have biographies written. We are yeah. desperately trying to find women who left writing. We are desperately trying to find people of color, whether they were free or enslaved, because there is now a great thirst for this. And it's not just for historians teaching history classes. It's to write mass market um, books for people who are really fascinated uh, by American history. 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and more and more people are finding each other. You know, the DAR just started a book club. You know, there are like <laughs> hundreds of thousands of DAR members. And part of the reason is because they are voracious readers of, Amer of American history. Now, one of the things mm -hmm. that Bob pointed out, I think it's interesting, you have to make sure that you don't betray your politics when you write about these things because America is for everybody on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yes. Know? So analytical writing can be one thing. You can pick your side. When you're writing biographical writing, you have to be careful to make sure that people who necessarily might not agree with your politics also are reading a story that represents their story because just like at the Supreme Court, you know, there were plenty of people who thought what John Marshall did was a good thing and plenty of other people thought it was a bad thing because in America – Somebody always thinks what happens is a bad thing. It doesn't make it <laughs> negative. It just means they're not in power. Right. And, you know, and when I say that these people wrote a lot and, and, and meant for it to be kept, you know, the, uh, what's great about modern American history now, I mean, whatever you think of Ken Burns, he, he, he really did engender a, a thought about what history is. But, uh, and the John Marshall, excuse me, the John Adams uh, PBS series, you know, uh, uh, Abigail Adams, even though she's in the book, she really is in this movie. In the HBO series. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Was it HBO or was PBS? But in, in, in any case, and, and, then, and then you have Hamilton. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't get people more excited than, than singing and dancing uh, colonials, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. The thing, as Stephen says, is exactly what Ron Cherno wrote, even let alone what happened. But, but, mm -hmm. but, but the, you know, it's sort of a wonderful thing. You want to be in the room where it happens. You want to be in the, the greatest city in the world, which was Philadelphia at the time, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. New York. You know, so, so, but, 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 you know, it's, it's. I'm sure it's interested. Every now it's on the Disney Channel, so kids watch it. You know, so, so it, it really is sort of a wonderful thing. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I was, I got a fan letter from him about the Buchanan book. And I'm thinking, Buchanan, the polka musical. You know, it's like, so like he's the hero now, Lynn Miranda uh, 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 of history. He's the, he's the keeper of history at this point. Right. Or what he does. Right. And I, I, this year, I just found out about Cyrus Bustle and the Mores and the Montiers, and it's just an amazing. And now, when's our next celebration? Is it 2026? 2026. Yes. 2026. And, and I, and I All right, so there's plenty of time for everybody. The DAR and the uh, American Museum of the Revolution here. There's just a lot that has to be written and put out there, whether it's PBS or RNL or Main Point Books. Kathy, I know you're here. So Kathy has both books. So if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Stephen Freed's Rush or a copy of Robert Strauss's book, John Marshall, The Final Founder. So we've learned tonight. We know it never ends. I like that. That's good. It never ends because we've got a park here in, in Radnor Township for Bishop Richard Allen, and we've got Octavius Cato downstairs, or downtown in front of City Hall. It right. does never end. And um, authors, Stephen Freed and Robert Strauss, thank you so much. This was wonderful, Radnor Historical Society. Uh, Jennifer, I know you're here somewhere. We have recorded this. I'm gonna send it over to Mainline Television. And, uh, and then possibly a YouTube video, I hope. We've gone a little bit over, but that's okay, I think. So thank you. Anyone else? Comments? Feel free to unmute yourself. And how's our chat box? I think we're done. But thank you, everyone. Stephen Thanks and for Robert. Having us. Thanks. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> American it's history. With Stephen. We didn't even argue. You, you, you missed all our arguments, my God. <laughs> The next basketball game, Facebook, we're going to have people. If you look people. on Facebook in about an hour, you'll see us back at it. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Good luck, everybody. And I hope to see you at Radnor Library or see you on Zoom at one of our next events. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. 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 Good night. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>